it's really a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to engage in conversation um, about grassroots justice efforts um, and how they can be, um, how local people can be empowered um, to create systemic change. Um, so I wanted to ask, just to start, if there's anything you would like to add to your introductions. Because so often, we're introduced by our professional educational credentials. And that's not really, doesn't really explain why we're doing the work we're doing. So I just wanted to see if there's something else you'd like to add that you think this audience should know about you. Thank you so much. It's a blessing to be here with you this evening to talk about some of the work that we do. I come from Sierra Leone, and I'm sure what is out there about Sierra Leone is not the best of information. We've had civil war for 10 years, and then we had the Ebola outbreak. We've had um, natural disasters. A couple of years ago, we had a landslide in the city that killed over 1,000 people. And so we are a nation that uh, we've gone through a lot, uh, but that has not changed uh, basic humanity. We're fighting for the same things that anyone anywhere else would want. We want, um, we want access to justice, we want access to essential services. People want to live a better life. People want to have a right to their property. They want to be consulted and they want their consent sought when um, someone is interested in taking their, their lands for certain purposes. And so I think ultimately this is a, a journey that I'm in and, and it's reflected in, in what's happening in other countries. And so, yes, I have worked um, for Namati, I've been in private practice, but ultimately uh, my conviction is um, molded by the experience that I've been through. And it's, it's not been the best of experiences, but in, in the midst of it all, I've, I've you know, been able to hold on to one thing, that we are essentially humans and we could, we could achieve the greatest good if we put our minds to it, irrespective of what we've gone through. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. Um, thanks, Doc. Um, doctor, right? <laughs> doctora. OK, Doctora is even better. And, and uh, Julia, thank you for the extremely generous introduction. Brown people can't blush, but. <laughs> I would be, beat red. Um, the only thing I would add is that you know the two of us happen to be here today, or the three of us happen to be here today, but um, the things we're talking about um, involve many, many more people, and we happen to be um, showing up here in San Francisco, but um, it's on behalf of a, of a whole, whole lot of uh, people who are often putting their lives on the line. So an estimated 4 billion, I understand, of 7.5 billion people living on, on Earth live outside the protection of the law. And you established Namadi to address this enormous gap in the world's legal systems. So the last couple of days, I've been reading articles and watching, pod, uh, watching TED Talks and podcasts and listening to these really compelling stories that you all tell about people who don't have IDs um, and therefore cannot work, people who don't have recognized property rights and therefore are vulnerable to land grab, uh, people who live with tremendous amounts of contamination and pollution. Um, can you tell us how you define legal empowerment and how you think this approach is going to change the on-the-ground realities of exploited, disenfranchised, marginalized communities? I mean, starting with law, first of all. Law, law is supposed to be the language we use to translate dreams about justice into living institutions that hold us together. Law is supposed to be the difference between a society ruled by the most powerful and one that honors the dignity of everyone, strong or weak. But that is not the world we live in. Doctora, your, your estimate, four billion, was actually from 10 years ago. There was this thing called the Commission on Legal Empowerment, and they estimated that four billion people live outside the protection of the law. 
just last week, um, there's an international justice task force, which I'm a part of, that came out with new numbers 10 years later. Uh, and it's based on data gathered by the World Justice Project and, and some other sources. And you would have hoped that in a decade, um, that figure would have gone down. But the opposite has happened. The, the, the newer estimate is 5.1 billion people lacking basic access to justice. And that means, as you said, I mean, these people are, can be intimidated by violence. They can be driven from their lands. They can be excluded from society. And so what we've been calling legal empowerment is about trying to take the power of law out of books and courtrooms where it's sometimes sleeping and, and put it in the hands of ordinary people. It's about democratizing law. And we like to think of three, three sort of steps or, or three, three dimensions to that, to that process. One is about knowledge. Um, the law is oftentimes so abstract and complicated and intimidating for anybody. Um, and one core aspiration of legal empowerment is to make it simple, make it make sense. Um, a second aspect involves agency. Um, I lived in, in Sierra Leone for four years with, with Sankita soon after the end of the Civil War there. Um, and if you go to a, a, a lawyer's office in, in Sierra Leone it, with a problem, they'll, they'll, they'll say to you in uh, Sierra Leonean Creole typically, okay, I don't hear you. Left the money, me go handle them for you. You know, I've, I've heard you. Leave some money on the table. I'm going to handle it for you. I've got you. I, I, I'm going to take care of you now, which is not that different from uh, a law office in San Francisco, probably. And the, the legal empowerment message is different. Not I'm going to handle it for you or I'm going to solve it for you, but we're going to solve it together. And in the process, you're going to get stronger. You're going to be more in a position to take on injustice yourself. Um, so knowledge, agency. The third one is about governance, um, that not only should everyone be able to understand and use the rules in, a, in, in addressing a problem that you face yourself, but that everybody should be able to shape the rules that affect everyone and, and, and take part in decisions that, 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 that matter to all of us. And so... In short form, no law, use law, shape law. I mean, those are the three things that our, 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 our belief is that everyone should be able to do. And right, right now, um, we are facing a lot of threats to democracy. Um, and giving up on democracy is not an option in my view. What we need to do is deepen it. And, and that's what we see this work as being a part of, is that project of deepening democracy towards a situation where everyone can understand the law, use the law, and, and shape the law. Thank you so much. Um, in concrete terms, what that means is that we have a group of very dedicated individuals in different countries, in India, in say, in Mozambique, and now in the US, who are not lawyers, but who are trained by lawyers on certain aspects of the law the areas in which we're focusing on, on land and, and the environment. And we deploy these folks in rural areas and they work directly with communities to provide legal education for them and to help them solve justice problems that they confront on a daily basis. So it could range from a company going in with an already prepared agreement for communities to thumbprint so that they could take away 42,000 hectares of land for 50 years these communities definitely do not understand um, the technical language in, in, in those agreements, uh, but they're compelled to sign because the government backs the, the corporation that's taking the land. Um, it could mean um, these non-lawyers supporting communities that have had their water sources polluted by tailings from an iron ore mine at the top of the hills overlooking their communities or their their rivers actually destroyed by the mining practice of a large-scale um, rutile mining operation, which ends up you know, on the walls of buildings like this one here. So in practical terms, this is what knowing the law, using the law, and shipping the law means. It means these very 
uh, brave folks going into communities and teaching them about the law and getting them to understand that they could take um, the future um, of their lives into their hands and they could push to make things happen differently. And ultimately, um, f they could also change the law that doesn't work for them. And that is a critical aspect of legal empowerment. Because many of our countries have inherited very bad laws, colonial laws that have not changed at all. In Sierra Leone, we have laws that are as old as 200 years. They're still in the books, they're still applicable today. And so by working with communities, getting them to use these rules, we're able to show on a very clear basis that these rules have no place in modern Sierra Leone, in, in modern society, and they ought to change for the benefit of communities. So this is how we practicalize legal empowerment on a daily basis in Sierra Leone. Yeah, so that's a great segue into my next question, which is um, about the existence really of unjust laws. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there, the concept of, of legal empowerment contains a normative assumption that law is empowering mm -hmm. rather than disempowering. Um, however, we're all familiar here in the United States, and I'm sure there's, there's many examples we could talk about from around the world, where law is a primary tool in reinforcing racial, gender, social, economic hierarchies. Um, the law is often not just. Um, using the law, engaging in legal action, um, may not only reinforce the status quo, but it also can be a humiliating, intimidating, and even dangerous endeavor. So how do you contend with the gap between what is legal and what is just? And how do you anticipate the adverse consequences of engaging with the law? Sure. Um, in Sierra Leone, people are, you know, either the first contact they have with, with the institution of the state is, is the law. When you listen to the radio and you, you hear announcements from government institutions, um, they normally end with warnings that, the, you know, the law will fall heavily on you if you're found wanting, or the law would take its course. And so most people, ordinary folks in the state, understand the law to be um, a coercive force that does not work for them, it works against them. It, um, it's a sledgehammer that comes down heavily on them if they don't behave themselves. And so um, f people have that view of the law and, and of the state, and even of lawyers. Lawyers are held in high esteem. Um, interestingly, we still dress with uh, you know, wigs and gowns, and we look very mystical. <laughs> And we we speak Latin in, in in court as well, so so it sort of you know confounds you know the ordinary person, and so law is seen as this very strange, this very far away tool that the state uses, and sometimes it expresses in the form of the police that comes in and makes the arrest. Um, communities don't understand that actually the law is for them. The law embodies their rights. The law is for their protection. It's for their use, and they could actually you know, use the law as a tool to defend their, their, their rights to, to push their interests. And um, that is something we, we, we are seeking to change and hoping to change with legal empowerment. That there is the coercive side of the law, that is the, in the not so good side of the law. But then there are rules within, you know, the law that you could use to, um, to defend your rights, you could use to push your interests, you could use to ensure that you are making your voices heard. And I hear you, Doc, when you talk about, uh, you know, f bad laws. We do, we do have a lot of those laws in place in the country. Um, one example is a 1927 law that vests all land in the provinces in a chiefdom council. So you, you would have, I mean, land is mostly held by families and communities, but then everything has been vested in a chiefdom council. And so technically, the chiefdom council, which is headed by a paramount chief, can contract out your land, your family land, without breathe, talking to you at all or breathing a word to you. And we've seen this happening in many situations where families are you know, in their villages and they wake up one morning and they, and they find tons of, of, of folks on their land erecting poles and demarcating their land. And when they ask, they tell them, well, your chief has sold off all of this portion of land to a company. So this would be the sort of situation that you know, they are faced with. And so I agree with you that there are laws that are terrible that are in the books. But if you, we don't attempt to you know, prove that they are bad, 
they would remain in the books and there wouldn't be any change to them. And so when paralegals work with communities to test what these laws mean in practice, um, that experience, that, that information, that data that they generate is then used to um, hopefully undertake advocacy that changes the law and brings in positive law. And that speaks to you know Vivek's uh, um, um, statement of uh, this process being a democratization of of, of governance, of lawmaking, because the hope is that communities themselves will be part of um, the new wave of, of reviewing laws and, and bringing in you know, better and more just tools that would really, you know, work for them. And so you know, it's, it's a challenging process because the sort of you know, place we are now in Thailand is that on one hand, we've made some progress to get you know, certain policies in place that are progressive, that, that really speak to the needs of communities, but then we still have existing laws that have not been changed. And so how do you bridge you know, this gap? How do you deal with the tensions? And I think it's constantly being at it. So it's not just an, an event. This is a process by which we, you know, we get communities' voices heard because quite frankly, they've not been used to that. Villages, communities, towns have not been used to um, having a say in, in contracts. Mm. They've not been used to asking questions of government institutions. So I think um, this is a process that's, uh, you know, that's um, going to last for a while. Uh, and, and ultimately what we see is a process that helps to change and transform um, the, the legal landscape in the country. I might just add a couple of things. Um, I mean, I, I agree that the, the law is very often a tool of repression. Um, I would just say a couple of things. One is that um, even when it's bad, even, even, even in, in terrible regimes and, and in cases where the, the, many of the laws are terrible, it is possible to find little hooks. It's like, um, it's like uh, looking for crevices on a rock face. Like you find a place where a hand or a few fingers or a toe can take hold and step up and then reach again and, and, and look once more. I, I spent the last couple of weeks in Myanmar, which is one of the places where we work with a team of community legal workers. I mean, talk about bad law and a bad regime. I mean, it, it, it's, it's been a horrific experience of dictatorship in Myanmar, um, military dictatorship, and, and there's been elections, but the military retains a lot of control over the country. Um, <clears throat> and there's a huge tradition of, of land grabbing um, by, by the military, by crony companies that continues to this day. Um, and yet, even in a place like Myanmar, community legal workers have helped people to find little crevices in the rock face, little levers and hooks that, that make it possible certainly not to succeed every time, but to get traction and, and, and move a case forward, for example, to undo a land grab or to protect rights over land that people still possess. And sometimes what helps is that the practice is even worse so than, 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 than the bad laws. So for example, the, the, you were talking about old colonial legislation. Myanmar is still bound by the 1894 Land Acquisition Act, which is Britain's old Land Acquisition Act. Britain is moved on, but, but Myanmar still got the 1894 version. And it's terrible. I mean, it's basically it was a law designed to disenfranchise. And yet many of the land grabs that have happened in Myanmar, they violate even those very, very modest terms of the 1894 Act. Like you're supposed to tell the communities what was the reason you were taking their land for. Um, and you're supposed to give some compensation if you do. And so we've managed to invalidate land grabs invoking that terrible law. Um, so that, that, that's one thing is that even when it's bad, part of the process of legal empowerment is just creatively finding opportunities despite, despite that picture. And then the second thing I would say is echoing, echoing you, Sankita, which is that <clears throat> that process of knowing invoking and invoking the rules, even when they're bad, that can be a powerful launching pad or powerful entryway to taking part in shaping the rules. Because oftentimes if you're so, dis if you're, if you're so far from it that, that the whole th thing is scary and foreign, 
um, it's hard to it's hard to enter this political conversation about what the rules should be. But if you've had the experience of like learning what was in that 1894 law and trying to undo um, a land grab that you experienced, even if you lost ultimately, that process of knowing and invoking, trying to use what what you do have. Um, we have found can be a, 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 a beginning to, to, to the process of engaging this, this, this bigger conversation about what the rules should be. Yeah, I mean, it really sounds like you're describing legal empowerment as a step towards political empowerment, right? Um, so I wanted to, um, as we've been talking about, uh, the last two years of my life have been very focused on the investigation of the murder of a, of a human rights defender in Honduras, Berta Cáceres. And um, so, you know, in Berta Cáceres' case is emblematic of a global trend where women are often engaged in these struggles um, to protect land and environment and at very great risks. What do you think the international community should be doing to address this risk, the risk of retaliation, um, um, the risk of violence, um, particularly in, in the context of development projects um, that receive funding from international institutions like the World Bank. I mean, I'll, I'll jump in and see, see what you want to add, Sankita. <clears throat> it's so ridiculous. I mean, we, we are in a global environmental crisis, all of us, all of us and our children and our grandchildren are at grave risk of losing everything we depend on. And yet the people who have the courage to stand up to defend those things that all of us depend on, they are at extreme risk. Um, and there are killings every year, every week of people who are defending the land and environment that they, they live on. It's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's an inexcusable and shameful contradiction. <clears throat> And Berta's not alone. I mean, we, we've had paralegals get death threats. I, I was, one of the cases we're working on, Myanmar involves eight uh, manganese mines in Shan State in, in Eastern Myanmar. Turns out seven out of eight, the licenses ex are expired. So they're, they're operating illegally and they've, they've poisoned the, the river and, and, and farmland near those mines. <clears throat> um, and, uh, the predecessor to the, or not not the predecessor, but there was an activist um, who was who was trying to help people do something about this, before the community legal worker who we work with even looked into the issue, and he was called by someone. You know, they don't necessarily you know explain who who's on the other line, and said, "Do you want? Is it money that you want? Would you like money, or do you want a bullet?" And um, people haven't seen him. We don't. They don't really know what what exactly happened to him. But he's not. He's not an activist anymore. And that's the sort of like background that this paralegal has as he begins to collect evidence and to to work on this case. He's he knows he's in danger. Um, <clears throat> and this this problem exists all over the place. We've had paralegals in our network get killed. Um, in terms of what can be done about it, and, and I, I wouldn't exclusively focus on international finance because actually some of the worst things happen by companies that aren't part of the international regime. These manganese mines are um, most probably Chinese financed, you know, which I suppose is international in a way, but I think it'd, it'd be a mistake to only zoom in on, say, the World Bank and the IFC. They're crucial, and they can help set standards that hopefully lift... Uh, the wider ecosystem, but but there's a lot more out there um, that 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 those monies don't necessarily touch. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I guess I would challenge that because at least in Latin America, no one has even the wealthiest don't have the money to build a forty five million dollar dam. Mm -hmm. So e even though yes, I mean, national actors are incredibly important in this scenario. Um, the international enablers, whether they be international institutions like the World Bank or um, development banks, foreign development banks, are are contributing to most of these situations. I totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. And the and the and the money from international finance institutions goes in places that it's not obvious because yeah. there's financial intermediaries. So they will they will give money to 
domestic banks yeah. who will then lend it out, and the domestic banks aren't bound by the same standards as the as the international institutions. But there, but this it's a big and messy game. Capitalism is, you know, and 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 uh, if you only paid attention to the World Bank or the IADB or something like that. Um, I don't think you'd catch the whole game. But anyway, I mean, I think one one principle that we would love to see um, is we had there's this tradition of whistleblower protection, mm. which primarily which, which which is a strong tradition. Um, and primarily, when we think of whistleblowers, it's it's employees. You know, it's like you're on the inside. Um, and you see something bad, and then you have the guts to complain about it, and then that 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 offers you some protection. Um, I would love to see that principle applied to people who are affected by environmental harm. So you're not you're not you're not an employee, but you live in the village downhill, you know, from the iron ore mine, or or the village that's in the catchment area of the hydroelectric dam, and and you have the guts to complain about environmental harms that are um, coming out of that industrial project, that there should be a whistleblower protection for affected communities um, is 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 one thing that I'd love to see. I mean, one of the challenges with this is that um, the very regimes from which you would seek protection are often the ones involved in collusion with companies and sometimes directly involved in violent retaliation. So that's one of the challenges: is how how do you um, who do you go to when, when the one that you should be able to go to is part of the problem? Um, we have a, I, I brought along a copy of this, um, of this, this uh, policy brief about financing and protection of grassroots justice defenders. And so there's more recommendations in here. One of the co-authors is right here, um, Stacy Cram. Um, uh, an, a, another opportunity, I think, and especially given that capital is so international, is to offer um, in international support for legal defense, for example, to make sure that people facing threats um, have resources to defend themselves um, and, to, and to get out of a dangerous situation if they need to. Um, and, I, and I think the, 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 the third and, and last thing I'll mention is just telling these stories. I mean, it's such a crime. It's such a crime. It's such a crime and a travesty that the people who are standing up for the resources that all of us depend on um, are, are, are being threatened and killed. And, and, and I think uh, sh casting more light on that, on that awful contradiction <clears throat> is crucial. So, Sankita, I'd, I'd love to move on and hear more about the work that you're doing in, in Sierra Leone. So last year, Sierra Leone's government suspended all forest logging concessions and is pushing for a review of mining contracts, is my understanding. Um, what do you think led to these developments, and how has the bottom-up approach advocated by, by Namanti uh, contributed to the, these developments, in particular, I'm interested in, in knowing whether how Namanti's community mapping project in Sierra Leone um, may have contributed. I mean, that's a lot. Well, yes. Um, I think one thing I should say up front is that um, we had elections in 2018, and there was a turnover of government. And what that means is um, the opposition became the ruling party. Um, one of the opportunistic things that we did uh, before the elections, uh, and that was at the prompting of, of Vivek when he visited um, the, the, the program, was that um, is there a way that we could uh, leverage the upcoming elections to um, wrestle some commitment from those who were seeking to win power? So that once uh, you know, we get those commitments from them, we could begin to hold them accountable. And so that set the stage for us to embark on a on, on a campaign, which, which we tagged our land, our future. And that campaign was uh, done with um, 12 other organizations and a host of the clients' communities we work with. So in total, we had over 6,000 of these um, community members signing a petition, calling on all the political parties to make certain commitments to protecting the environment and respecting tenure rights. So some of the things we, you know, they asked for was, access to all investment-related information, 
um, a cessation of uh, activities that deforested uh, um, the last remaining 5% of our um, primary forests. Um, ensuring that uh, you know the coastlines, our beautiful beaches, are not depleted by sand mining. We got um, all of the major parties to commit to um, the pledge because the people threatened that we would not vote for you if you don't commit to these you know these sets of commitments. We were surprised. Yes, absolutely. I mean, they came to they, they, they came to a conference. We got our clients from all over the country, and we, we, were, we, we were in the background and we allowed our clients to tell their stories of the impact of large-scale mining and large-scale agriculture on their lives. And some of them were like, what is this happening in the country? This is serious. Or we, and they made some very big commitments, and they were caught on camera making those commitments, and we have the evidence. And the very next day, we put them on TV as well. It was, it was reported all over the country. So we told them, we have you on record now. And so after the elections, the opposition won, and they had endorsed the, uh, the pledge. Um, one of the first things the government did, the new government, was to suspend all um, you know, the, you know, the timber export. Because for some reason, we don't have you know, a lot of you know, natural forests left, but we were giving licenses to exploit the less than 5% that was remaining. And so we felt it was a good um, step. It was a step in the right direction. Uh, but then a couple of months later, the government announced that it was setting up a commission. Uh, and the, the commission was going to investigate and look into ways of restarting the timber trade, but with increased transparency. And we felt very disappointed and we're like, really? I mean, is this the way to go? We, we don't have enough forests left and you're announcing a commission for transparency on, on, on exploitation of, 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 of um, forest resources. So we wrote to the president, Namati wrote an open letter to the president, and we told him that, listen, this is a violation of your, your election promises and your commitment to the people. Mm -hmm. uh, on uh, the 27th of February 2018, when you made you know, those, those pronouncements that you would, you would support. Um, um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so the thing is, he wrote back to us to say, and, and that was you know, pleasantly uh, surprising for us that he actually got back to say, well, yes, we made those commitments. Um, we take the environment very seriously and we are committed to protecting um, what's left of our resources. Now, the sad part was that apparently the commission that they had set up had found that there was 93,000 containers worth of timber that had been caught and ready for shipment to mostly China. Yes, I, I, you know, I couldn't wrap my head around the figure because, you know, how many trees, how many forests would you have depleted to get ninety-three thousand worth of containers? Um, so the, you know, the the, the 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 long and short of it was that the the the, the 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 commission said that they would allow for the exportation of this ninety-three thousand worth of timber, but, don't cut anymore. but then they would they would not cut anymore. So there was a ban on. In fact, they cancelled all the licenses to um, to fell trees. And the government committed to reviewing the laws, um, the forestry laws, as well as um, um, you know how these things are, are managed. And so again, we followed up with an op-ed calling for uh, the government to put the communities that are at the forefront, the, the, the ones that actually own the forests, mm. um, you know, to give them the the space to to contribute to these new laws that they're planning to you know to to to, to roll out. Because ultimately, these forests uh, do not belong to the government; they belong to these communities. And so, if you want to make rules on how to manage them, you can't just sit in the capital and make those rules. You need to go and talk to them. And in fact, when we were, you know, discussing with them, we gave them examples of local community leadership, of chiefs who had banned logging in their communities and who were enforcing those, those, those uh, customary rules that they had, uh, I mean, you know, you know, rolled out in their communities. And so we. We basically told the president that you need to copy from these local leaders and, and really you know, step up and, and be responsible. So we, 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 we do have that situation. Um, now the government has announced the start of the process of uh, reviewing the, the laws on, on, on forestry and, and, and they claim that the emphasis would be on you know, reforestation and afforestation. So um, we're pleased that that has happened and we'll see how that sort of pans out over the next, um, um, you know, maybe 12 to 24 months. But ultimately, the focus has to be on the people who are most adversely affected. They should have a, a stake. They should have a say in this in, in this particular process. 
um, I think these are the kinds of things we'd like to see. Um, communities having, you know, um, a seat at the table. But then that does not just happen. It's um, it's the result of painstaking work with communities. It's a result of empowerment, giving them legal education, getting them to understand that, quite frankly, government has power, but government doesn't own the land. The land belongs to you. And so if anything is to happen to the land, you should have a vital say in, in, in that particular process. And I think that is the, you know, the, the, the essence of, of legal empowerment and the, the essence of good lawmaking. Because, you know, you know, Invariably, the, the, the people who suffer the most are not the government officials. Um, they're the, um, the, you know, the communities that are sitting uh, below the mines or the communities whose, whose lands have been taken or whose forests have been, have been destroyed. So, so this is what we're looking at, um, um, pushing through throughout the, you know, the whole country. Um, I think ultimately, it's it's a fight for the you know for the soul of of the country, because as Vivek mentioned, um, Sierra Leone is a country with um, vast natural resources. And even before I was born, that was the saying that we are so blessed. We have marine resources, we have gold and diamond and bauxite and rutile and and, and iron ore. But um, just a couple of months ago, the government announced a moratorium on fishing. Like they banned fishing in the country for an entire month because we were running out of fish. I mean, we have huge um, Chinese uh, trawlers coming in and essentially just taking everything from the, from the bed of the of, of our seas. So the young fish, the eggs, everything everything is destroyed in in their quest for 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 fish that we don't see in our local markets. And so that was a sobering call when the announcement came out that we don't have fish left in the sea and there has to be this moratorium. And you know, it got us thinking that it's the same situation with uh, the land-based resources. We keep saying we have gold and diamonds, but they're no longer there. We've dug them up. And in the process, we've destroyed the environment. And the people who are suffering, you know, the brunt of these, these actions are the communities who live in those places. And sadly, when this, com this, this company is mine, they don't go back to reclaim the land. They take what is there and they leave. And the government doesn't have the resources to go back and help the communities reclaim the land. And so ultimately, what we want to see happening in, in the country is when paralegals help communities negotiate an agreement with them, a mining company, for example, we would want to have clauses in those agreements that would bind the company to reclaim the land and to do things that would ensure that as best as possible, the land is put back into some use um, that communities could uh, uh, benefit from. And if they don't do that, um, they could take them to court for, uh, for breach of those agreements. So, so I, wanna I wanna ask about the community, because we all know communities aren't homogenous. Um, and you're, you're, you're engaging in struggles over property and dignity and survival um, that, that are difficult and long. And I'm, I'm wondering what you have learned about how to sustain, how to foster community cohesion, cohesion how to foster um, that over a long period of time. Um, so, th so that's one thing we, we our paralegals always do, is, um, and, and that is to manage expectations. So that one of the first things they tell communities is that this could be um, a very long fight. So don't have your hopes that we could resolve this thing in a, in, in a few weeks or a few months or even a few years. Because you're dealing with corporations with sometimes more money than the government. And so you, you, you can't even compare. Um, you're dealing with corporations that can get um, the best lawyers and they could also, you know, buy government officials. I mean, it's, it's not uh, um, something that's uh, uh, um, unique. And so we prepare them to be able to um, go into this with, 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 you know, their eyes opened, that this could be for the long haul. And if you, if you don't want to do this, then you could... You could, you could as well give in to the company. But when they look at what they stand to lose, um, they're able to be resilient. They're able to say, this is something that we've had for generations. This has been in our, in our, in our, in our possession for 
hundreds of years and we're not going to let go. And so making sure that you temper expectations with what the reality would be is absolutely important. And because the paralegals we work with are based in the communities, um, it helps because they see them on a regular basis, they talk to them, they speak their language, they understand uh, what the dynamics is. And we also try and go beyond simply working with community leaders. Mm -hmm. Because in our experience, we've seen situ situations where they get bought by companies. Mm -hmm. And in one particular case, um, you know, Vivek knows about that. Um, a community came to us and we were working with their leaders and we had engaged with the company and this was a, a Zircon company. They were mining Zircon that was occurring on the, on the shores. So the waves brought the Zircon and the company asked um, the community members there that if you could bring a bucket of sand to us, we'll give you X amount of Leons. And that essentially destroyed the whole coastline because you know people were just digging up the sand and taking it to the, the the Chinese company, and they would process and then ship the the zircon out. And that affected the land. So once the sand was what you know was 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 taken out, um, the waves came in and, and began eating into the into the into the hard rock and and, and, and the land. Um, when we started the action against the company, they reached out to the leaders and compromised them. And then suddenly our clients no longer cooperated with us. They, they wouldn't pick our calls, they would not come to the office, they would not talk to us. And so that was a very vital and bitter lesson for us because we realized that you know, for you to be in this for the long haul, you need to go beyond the leaders because they could get co-opted and, and corrupted. And so um, we now ensure that we have lifelines into the communities. We hold community interactions on a regular basis. Certain decisions are not made by the leaders. So whenever there is a milestone that we need to take, let's say we switch from trying to negotiate with the company to taking another line of action, we just don't talk to the leaders. We go into the communities and convene them. Um, if, it, if it has to be village by village, we do that. And when we have these meetings, we just don't have general meetings of everyone sitting there. Because of, because, of course, we have cultural issues. Women don't necessarily um, speak up and take part in these proceedings. So we divide them up. So you have women's only consultations. You have the youth. You have the old men. Um, um, last year, when, when, when Vivek visited, we were consulting on the remedies for a, a huge matter that we were dealing with. A, you know, an iron ore company had polluted um, the water sources, had destroyed the swamp land of over nine villages. And so um, we were looking at, at remedies. And so we had to divide the people up, the women and, and the men and, and the old men. And interestingly, they all came up with different versions of what they would like to see. And quite frankly, the women had the best ideas, <laughs> really. And so making sure that we have these things in place is, is crucial. Otherwise, um, we would not be able to manage communities and, and really work with them throughout these processes because cases, we try our best to resolve these cases within a short period of time, but there is no guarantee. You know, sometimes they could run up to two or three years and, and, and that would be a problem if you didn't manage expectations properly. As you can see, I mean, it, you, you, from Sankita's answer, the question you ask just kind of cuts to the heart of the, the, the complexity and the challenge of the, this kind of work. Um, because communities are not homogenous, and these are fraught questions about development, about values, <clears throat> and there's a risk to oversimplify or romanticize <clears throat> what, the, what the community's position is. I'll just add to, to that rich um, <clears throat> reflection from Sinkita one, one pragmatic lesson and one kind of forward-looking aspiration pragmatic lesson is that <clears throat> a lot of the environmental movement <clears throat> um, has often focused on the question of whether projects should happen, you know, like should this happen or not. People mobilize to, to try to oppose harmful projects. Um, that does, that, that, that debate about whether something should happen or not does <clears throat> oftentimes divide communities as well because there's a promise of jobs or revenue or, um, and then on the other hand these costs and 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 <clears throat> people can genuinely come on diff come down on different sides um, of that debate um, environmental compliance we have found <clears throat> can be a very powerful entry point that um, in a way 
sidesteps some of that fraught character. Because when you have, because in a, in a lot of places, <clears throat> the question of whether something should happen has passed and people are coexisting with factories or mines or infrastructure projects. And the question is, yeah, how are those, how are those industrial or, 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 or plantations, Sierra Leone, we deal with oil palm plantations, sugar cane, plant, sugar cane plantations, how are these industrial projects, now that they exist, now that we're here together, how are they going to operate according to what rules, on what terms? And when there are already rules on the books, are they abiding by them or not? And so if you can I, um, work on violations of existing rules or terms, in a way, there isn't a really a loser in that equation from the community side. The company may lose because it's it, it's it's uh, nice and inexpensive to flaunt the rules that you're bound by, but it but even the ones who value the presence of the investment because they have concluded that they think that the economic benefits outweigh the harms, they tend not to disagree with the idea that they should follow the freaking rules. You know that if if they're not supposed to emit a certain effluent in the water, they shouldn't be doing that. And also because that's a question of public compliance, you actually don't need the whole community to agree. You know, you, you, you can actually begin by working with a handful of active, committed, public spirited people who are saying, it, this is poisoning me and my family and it's poisoning all of us and I'm willing to do something about it. And you can start there with a small group. You don't necessarily have to convene a massive community meeting or, or try to arrive at a consensus. You could actually start with a small group and, and, and start engaging government to say, we want you to enforce these rules. They're, they're being in violation. It does, it's not really a question of property rights or it doesn't require a, a, a collective consensus. So that, that's a pragmatic lesson is that sometimes when things are fraught, this is an example of how you can find an entryway. In terms of uh, the, the forward-looking aspiration I was going to offer is just around deliberation. I, 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 we put a lot of stock in this idea that, <clears throat> which is really a, a, an, a, a, an evolution of the idea of, of democracy itself, is that in conversation, genuine conversation among uh, equals on equal footing. It's possible to make progress. It's possible to build common understanding. And so we're investing right now in ev everywhere we work, uh, putting in time and space to actually engage in that kind of deliberation so we can wrestle together with the with the trade-offs and, and with what, what are the true costs of something? What are the true benefits? Um, uh, and and so that and this is part of the empowerment journey is to equip communities in an informed way to be able to come to collective decisions and collective action. So before we um, open it up for questions, I wanted to ask one last question, which is about your work in the United States. So last year you made the decision to begin a program in Maryland and Washington D.C. So why are you why you work in this is your seventh country or sixth country? Sixth country. Why the United States? And and what lessons do you think you've learned elsewhere that are going to illuminate the work in the United States? Yeah, this was, thank you. This was a, a long-standing dream that is now um, at the beginning of uh, feeling real. Um, why the United States? I mean, a couple of reasons. One is we want to be able to tell a universal story about legal empowerment. This isn't just something that matters to some people far away or certain kinds of countries. This matters to everyone, everywhere. Um, and so as a global organization that's aiming to grow a global field and a global movement, it's important for us to have that diversity um, in, in the kinds of places where we are engaging. And then more importantly than that, um, we saw a massive need and a, and a real opportunity. The U.S. has a huge access to justice crisis. We, we were saying, we were talking now, we are joking. I mean, when, when I moved to Sierra Leone, there were 100 lawyers in the country total and more than 90 lived in Freetown in the capital. So there's really like this, you kind of have to think about community paralegals because there's no way even a rich person couldn't get counsel in the provinces. That's not the problem here. I live in DC, there's like 100 lawyers on my block. You know, so it's not, it's not, it's not that we have a lawyer shortage, but we have an access to justice crisis. And, and there are so many people, Kate Richardson is here who's, who's, who's wrestling with this problem. Um, there, there are so many people in the United States with dire, life or death legal needs who cannot access basic help. Um, and on environment in particular, 
we have some of the same conditions that we see in India, for example, um, exist here. Number one, we have an environmental movement, with all due respect, that um, has tend to focus on high-level litigation and on policy advocacy, and the communities who are most affected by environmental harm in the United States, who are largely poor people, people of color, they have tended to be left out of that environmental movement historically, and their ability to understand and use the law themselves to protect themselves has been has been limited. And if anything, there's a lot of distrust and disconnect between the kind of traditional environmental movement and um, the the people who've borne the burden. Um, that that is one sort of similarity. A second one is a big enforcement gap. Um, I mean, part of the reason why uh, in a place like India, Sierra Leone is, is different in a way because th there's such little law that we, we actually need to really be creative and try to bring a regulatory framework into place. In, in India, there's a strong regulatory framework on the books, um, and there's huge lack of enforcement. In India, the, the comptroller, auditor general put out numbers showing noncompliance rates as high as 60%. This is the government's own numbers. Turns out the U.S. also has a massive enforcement gap. The, the Patuxent River flows through Maryland, if anybody knows the East Coast. There are over 100 facilities on the Patuxent River, which if you go to the EPA federal website, on the company's own self-reports are in noncompliance with the Clean Water Act. So, so an environmental movement that's largely been top down, a massive enforcement gap, concentration of harms among poor people and people of color. And bas basically what we want to try to do is um, in partnership with the U.S. environmental justice movement, which is rich and longstanding, um, to, to see what we can do to equip those communities of, who are burdened with environmental harm to, to understand and use the law themselves, to protect themselves, which, which, which is crucial for their own survival and ultimately crucial for all of us because we, we all depend on those resources. Um, and so we've got a, a new crew of five, we don't call them community paralegals, I can get into why, we choose different names, different places, we call them legal empowerment advocates. They're all organizers basically who have been, or, or, or connected to existing community groups, they've been wrestling with these issues for a long time, they're interested to learn more about the law and to find, outside of the courts, to find administrative remedies and, and administrative channels by which communities can, on their own, um, pursue creative solutions. Thank you so much. I mean, when after this conversation, we should talk. <laughs> I think California has a very rich environmental justice movement, and communities of color have been working very hard to bring the human right to water to California. Um, and it would be great to put you in conversation with some of the groups that are leading that, that struggle.